morning uh, investigates theories that really found in a range of textual sources on medieval optical theory that Lorenzo Ghiberti knew. What we find in common with these sources is a concern with the creation and perception of different surface levels through the disposition of light and shadow, or in some cases, the representation of different surface levels through the use of black and white pigments. Throughout his so-called third commentary, Ghiberti describes similar relationships between light and surface effects in terms borrowed from the logical theory. One such phrase, le sottili sculture, appears numerous times. Ghiberti's source for these subtle sculptures, or Ibn al-Haytham, or better known in Latin as al-Hazm, and Vitello, whose writings were important sources for the science of optics and the aesthetics of vision in the later Middle Ages and early Renaissance, in which I argue the concept and aesthetics of relief appeared frequently. The major question my paper raises is, how can we understand Gaberti's uh, knowledge of medieval optical theory to have affected his artistic production? To answer this question, I will offer a close reading of Gaberti's bronze tomb of Leonardo Dati from circa 1425, in Santa Maria in Ravella, Florence, which above all else, um, excuse me, which above all other relief sculptures by his hand embodies the notion of subtle sculpture. This sculpture, which is extremely thin, was initially installed next to the high altar in the monk's choir, an area primarily lit by candlelight. Um, and uh, primarily, Primarily, the, primarily the, by Kendall, excuse me. I argue that Ghiberti fully understood how the slight wood of the times makes the form of Dati's body visible, yet at others, the form of the Dominican general would fade into invisibility, a tension exploited beautifully by Ghiberti's handling of the bronze. In book two of his commentaries, Ghiberti described this sculpture of the great general of the Dominican order and prior of Santa Maria de Bella and Leonardo Dati as La Sepultura e de Poco Rilievo. He began this work at bronze shortly after Dati's death in 1424, and he claims to have drawn the figure from life, il quale quasi naturale, and to have finished the work in 1425. The slab is 7.5 feet long, 2.8 feet wide, and circa 5 inches high. 0.5, excuse me, inches high. Uh, it's quite set thin, as you can see. Um, it's presently located in the Virtuali Chapel, which was an extension of the eastern transept built sometime before. Uh, 1325, and you can see this on the um, plan to the right. So its present location uh, is not its original. Originally, however, Dati's tomb was placed in the center of the monk's choir, and according to Filippo Baldanucci, uh, it marked the eastern limit of the church of 1094, where the main door had been, and you see this right here. It was then removed in 1565 during the Sari's reconstruction of the church to the pavement in front of the chancel, and again in 1861 to a, quote, obscure recess at the back of the high altar where historian James Wood Brown saw it in 1902. And I'll say more about its original location um, in a bit. But first, the sculpture is a tour de force of what Richard Krautheimer called pictorial relief, whereby Ghiberti suggested space and depth by combining three-dimensional forms of flatter and flatter ones. The form of the general's body is finally outlined against the bronze and his body rises slightly out of the surface. The outermost edges of his feet, hands, and head mark the highest points of relief as they all emerge over the slab, while the dark bronze, the delicate hand, and the forms give the tomb a sense of solemnity and dignity. Due to the fine handling of the material by Gaberti, Dante's body seems to once recede into the background as if his body is faded into a brazen afterworld and to ever so slightly encroach upon the space of the observer. Ghiberti here brilliantly mediated between the heavenly world symbolized by the bronze and the material world of the spiritually charged space of the church. For these reasons, Ghiberti's description of the tomb as rendered in little or slight relief needs to be considered more fully. In his own description, Ghiberti designated his tomb as a type of sculpture distinct from others, specifically from statues, which he called the Fatua. In describing the formal qualities of the tomb sculpture, Ghiberti emphasized the illusion of materiality, of the three-dimensional corporeality of the deceased. However, there is minimal three-dimensional projection in the sculpture. The entire surface can be understood as a series of parallel planes, one behind the other, 
in which the form of Batsy's corpse coheres visually to signify the illusion of volume. The general's feet, hands, and head all project highest from the surface, while the remainder of Batsy's body recedes into the background space. You can see this clearly from photos taken in situ. The form of the body seems to contain more mass than the bronze lab itself, especially where the light hits his right shoulder, differentiating the surfaces more clearly. You can see that with this. Further, the brilliant passages of etching around the head of the general, the pillow and tassels, and the ornamental decoration which outlines Dati's shoulders and head, today lend an almost a halo effect, though presumably these once covered the entire pillow and have been worn out in time. All of these forms barely rise from the surface of the sculpture, yet each are differently leveled one to the next. Finally, look at the gown. At left and right, the parallel stride the horizontal folds, rise gently from both sides, undulating here and there, demonstrating the formal aesthetics of relief, of the relationship between surface and depth, and then crescendo in the middle of the body where the general's hands lay, marking one of the highest points in the sculpture. Yet from here, they furrow beneath the hands on the central axis of the sculpture to re-emphasize the different surface levels this relief contains. Dati's tomb embodies what was considered by theorists at the time to be the quintessential qualities of relief, namely the illusion of forms attained through the manipulation of material planes via light and shadow. If we contextualize the sculpture around Ghiberti's own writings, the formal and stylistic elements of this very flat relief can be understood in terms of its optical properties. Ghiberti begins the third commentary with an extended discussion of light and its effects on various types of surfaces or bodies, and then moves on to descriptions of sculptures he deems noteworthy. Throughout, he describes both the theoretical and the formal differences between concave and complex surfaces, and a beholder's ability to make up fine carvings in relief, or engravings even, in terms of the fall of light and shadow on the surface. For example, he claims, many things do not reveal the subtleties of their sculpted surface, as long as they are in a dim light or in a dark environment. But if they are brought into an illuminated environment or a place with strong light, or if they, help, or if they are held against the sun, one sees the things which are hidden in, dim, in the dim light or in the dark. And similarly, this is a quote, the eye cannot perceive the composition of the subtle relief in a dark place. That is to say, it is invisible to human perception. This phrase, les sculptures socle, appears three other times at the beginning of the third commentary, all in chapter three, um, 3.27, 3.36, and 3.37. And this is where he describes the theoretical properties of, of light in the, on different types of surfaces and when and how an observer can see subtle engravings or carvings. The source for this, Kultoy Sotri, was Al Hazm, in whose writings on optics the concept and aesthetics of relief appeared frequently and was, no, and was the most important source for the science of optics and the aesthetics of vision in the late medieval period. The most important of these texts was his 11th century Kitab al Manzir, or better known as the Book of Optics, which was translated into Latin as De Aspectibus in the late 12th or early 13th century. In Book 1 of this treatise, the Islamic philosopher and scientist discusses visible surface in terms of relief, terms that Ghiberti paraphrased, likely from a 14th century Italian translation now in the Vatican. For instance, Al Hazm claimed, Oftentimes, subtle characteristics of subtle tracings or carvings are invisible to sight when they are in dimly lit or dark locations. However, just as interestingly, Al Hazan also claimed one could only observe the subtle relief if the object was tilted or inclined in some way, which implies the visible aspect of the object changed. Uh, Al Hazan described the process in the following manner. Afterward, if the observer inclines the body away from the original location so that the reflection takes place to another spot outside the location of his eyes, and if in this case a moderate light shines upon that body, then the observer will make out the engravings in it that he had not made out when the light was reflected from the body to his eyes. Alhazen was interested in the threshold conditions of sight. That is to say, how an excess or deficiency of light can affect what is visible to the human observer based on standpoint. 
In doing so, he demonstrated that the material differentiation between body and surface, or we might even argue figure and ground, could be perceived in accordance with a change in the object's position in relation to the eye. He explained this in terms of the surface's relationship to light and shadow, depending on where the light falls in this relationship to the subtle sculpture and the observer's line of sight, certain forms on the surface or in the planar field can be perceived as the material provided uh, observer in the correct viewing position. The surface is not simply polished or flat, it's in the deep. We can further follow this concept by understanding how the term asperitas or roughness, um, a term also picked up by Gaberti to describe the physical and aesthetic properties of relief, how this term expressed the visible intention or characteristic of an object. Al-Hazan introduced this notion in De Aspectibus. There are 22 such visible intentions, including distance, position, and corporeity. For Al-Hazan, asperitas was a visible characteristic that conveyed the material makeup of the object to the eye and related virtual image to the mind. Al-Hazan ex explicated this idea when describing an incident when an observer looked at a rough at a rough surface. He explained how, um, and this is a longer quote, um, but I'm not, I'm not going through all of it. He explained how, quote, when light re reaches the depressed portions, it will also create shadows, so that the raised portions will also be exposed to light and revealed. If shadows are formed in the depressed portions, but no shadow exists on the raised portions, the form of light will vary on the surface of that. This idea was echoed in Vitello, whose 1275 Perspectiva provided an important commentary on Althazan's De Aspectibus and, again, <coughs> paraphrased by Gaberti. Vitello followed Althazan closely in describing what effect the 22 visible intentions had on aesthetics, that is, on an object's beauty or its correct appearance. For instance, the asperitas of woven fabrics was pleasing to the eye, as well as the asperitas of, quote, other things, aliorum. One should consider reliefs among these other items for consideration, because throughout the text, Vitello suggests the concept of relief in the Middle Ages was not only considered an artistic technique, but also a quality of visual perception. He spoke to the visible quality of asperitas and how he understood a real object in the world to contain protuberances and hollows on the surface, casting shadows, and allowing certain aspects of the object to appear differently when viewed under certain conditions especially with regard to lighting. In Proposition 139, he argued, quote, since roughness consists in the differences in the situation of the surface of a body, it is clear that the prominent parts cause shadow when light falls on the surface of that body. Therefore, the prominent parts of the body's surface will be open to light and revealed. And in the depressions beneath the higher parts, shadows will reach out, mixing with, them, mixing with the light that falls there. There is an obvious parallel to relief carving in this instance, and in the others. And I think this is important to consider when we try to compare the various interests in theoretical optics with the sculptural production. Yet there are also clues in the text that can help us parse this out. For instance, Ghiberti builds from his interest in the optical properties of surfaces in relation to light and the subsequent disposition of forms in his famous descriptions of sculptures he had seen in the situ. For example, he described the ancient sculpture of a draped figure he saw in Padua that legendarily was buried underneath Bernaleski's house in Florence as containing, quote, many refinements the eye cannot see in either strong or moderate light. Only the hand touching it finds them. Um, and I apologize for this. I had an image from John Gage's book, um, but it didn't make it to the PowerPoint. Um, at any rate, he makes it very clear that he first saw the statue of Hermaphrodite in quote moderate light, uh, una temperata luce, and that quote, one could not see Niccolo, Niccoli's intaglio Dianides in the Palladium, which should be here, <laughs> well in strong light, una forte luce, because quote, when fine polished stones are carved, the strongest, the strong light and reflection conceal the carving. This carving could not be seen by turning, could best, excuse me, the carving could best be seen by turning the card part against the strong light, then one may see it perfectly. 
John Gage noted that Gumberti's third commentary, far from being a haphazard collection of copied and paraphrased texts, had some kind of logical organization, one that reflected his interest as a sculpture, a sculptor, in both visual perception and visuality, an argument that Janice L. Hurd greatly amplified in her 1980 essay on the same subject. Though Gage limited himself to Gumberti's work as a goldsmith and a jeweler, we can by extension understand how his relief sculptures fit into this model especially his flat or low relief executed in the 1420s. In addition to his obvious interest in natural philosophy and optics, Ghiberti was likely motivated to think about these relationships in response to similar works by Donatello, who was developing his own style of Cacciato Riviero in relationship to optics and perspective, which you all know so well and which have justly been celebrated. And on the top is St. George and the Dragon from 1420. Uh, 17 and the London Ascension from 1428, uh, to take just two examples. In most respects, I would argue Gabarti sh uh, should garner as much attention for his work in the relief and their optical properties as Donatello has, though this does not seem to be the case. For example, his relief panel of the Baptism of Christ for the Baptismal Font in Siena around 1427 balances both very high relief and passages of very low relief that establishes an impressive illusion of depth of field. See especially the angels with strongly foreshortened wings and limbs, and the clouds which are quite low, yet proceed in a great depth perspectively. This depth is matched, or perhaps even doubled, by the figure of God, who, uh, in high relief, you see there, um, who pushes strongly out from the plane, creating a zooming effect into and out of the pictorial field. So you see here these angels in low relief in the perspectival thrust into depth, and then God is coming out on the opposite side. The Dati tomb plaque, of course, fits this model almost perfectly, and I want to return to it and to the question of its original location. It is almost impossible to know what the sculpture looked like in circa 1427 in the center of the monk's choir, especially in terms of lighting. And I don't want to dive into speculative art history or virtual reconstructions of the path of the sun in the 15th century. Nor is it at all clear if the choir would have been enclosed at this time as it was earlier, and if so, how this would have affected natural light in the area the plaque was interred. However, I feel confident that Ghiberti would have taken light into account when he produced the bronze uh, work, whether candlelight, <coughs> that of the diurnal sun, or both, more likely. And this area of the church is quite bright, especially moving east to west. The windows piercing, um, you can see this here from this plan, the windows piercing the three principal sides of the transepts and they require proper. Would have produced and still do today a brilliant light in this part of the church. And here's some photographs. These are from Marvin Trappenberg's latest book, Building in Time. Um, the windows piercing the three principal sides of the transepts and the choir proper would have produced and still do today a brilliant light in this part of the church, especially from morning to midday or from the liturgical hours of prime to non. And this is not to even mention the candles that would have been uh, fired throughout the day. One can imagine how the lighting would have affected the display of Dati's body throughout the day, given his brother's various standpoints within the choir as they walked around at times the general would have been would have seemed enlightened or even animated to them by the fall of natural light on the brazen material. And yet at others solemnly part of the afterworld he had joined just after death. In this way, Ghiberti's tomb <coughs> represents in perfect harmony the dual nature of Christian eschatology. By way of a brief conclusion, I want to consider how Ghiberti's theories of relief relate to other Quattrocento writers and their theories especially Alberti's Sermus Rievo. After all the optical treatises Ghiberti relied on, Alberti did as well. And in them, a theory of relief in painting emerged in parallel to the one I discussed above. For instance, Vitello theorized painting in relief in painting. In Proposition 141, he explained how the distance between an observer and an object, in this case, the object being explicitly referred to as a painted image, might cause an observer to err in his or her perception of the object's asperitas or relief. In 
this was a quote. Also, an excessive distance causes an error in the visual perception of roughness and smoothness, so that pairs or lines depicted in any painted image, roughness is judged on account of a line of separation. And this is because the sense is accustomed to seeing roughness in real hairs. Likewise, if a moderately rough body is placed opposite the eye from a great distance, it will be judged as smooth, because from such a great distance, the differences, the difference of the parts or the projection of the shadows of the prominent parts over the lower ones cannot be discerned and, in, and so judged, it, judged, judged, sorry, and so smoothness is judged in. If an observer is located too far away from the object, the roughness or apparent three-dimensionality seemingly disappears into planarity or pure superficiality. The relief, of course, never goes away. Upon closer inspection, the observer understands the hair to contain certain, a certain materiality or roughness or volume even, which it, distinguishes it from other hairs and other parts of the body that are not hairs. In this way, a asperitas or relief should be understood as a sign, as a signifier. Finally, it is evident in Pittura that Alberti understood the perceptual qualities of relief as well as its practical application in painting. It is known that Alberti had access to a knowledge of geometric optics elucidated by Al Hazan and his Latin commentators, and Alberti seemed to echo their concern for the relationship between the surface of, of objects in the world and beholders mediated via light as well as the concern for the properties of convex and concave surfaces in relationship to light and shadow. In chapter 46 or 47, uh, sorry, he says, just as the incident of light and sh shade make it apparent where surfaces become convex or concave, or how any such part slopes and turns this way or that, so the combination of white and black achieves what the Athenian painter Nicias was praised for, and what the artist above all else must desire that things he paints should appear in maximum relief. This very specific description of the relationship between light, shadow, and convex and concave surfaces does not appear in the section of Pliny's Natural History that Alberti uh, cites as an ancient example of relief in painting. In other words, he's taking this from another source. Of Nic Nicias, Pliny only says that he was a master of light and shade, and that was nothing regarding the surfaces of objects in the world. Rather, here, Alberti was reliant on medieval objects, like Alberti, in formulating his theory of relief from painting. And for those, this reason, those mentioned above, I think we should begin to reevaluate Alberti's role in contributing to our understanding of the aesthetics of relief during this period. Thank you very much. <laughs>